and environmental stewardship through a traditional ecological knowledge lens. Welcome, Jules. And I'll go through our other panelists really quick. We're happy to have Francesca Coe. Francesca currently serves as the program chair and director for the Greater Farallons Association and as a member of the Greater Farallons National Marine Sanctuary Advisory Council in a conservation seat. For nearly a decade, Francesca worked at the Natural Resources Defense Council as the director of strategic initiatives, where she led myriad efforts to advance, to enhance equity and resource protection and advance clean energy solutions. The longtime editor of deeperblue.com, Francesca is presently focused on the restoration of bull kelp and recovering marine habitats in the Golden State. And uh, I'll drop it in the chat after this. Everyone should definitely follow her on Instagram at kelp princess. It's a good time. Welcome also to Fred Keeley. Thank you for being here. Former California Assembly Speaker Pro Tem Fred Keeley is the author of the Marine Life Management Act, the Marine Life Protection Act, and the California Ocean Science Trust Act. So we love that you're here on our, on our law day. Together, this legislative package constitutes the most comprehensive revision of California's marine management laws in 100 years. Today, these acts address the impacts of climate change and other threats to the coast and ocean environment. Bio speaks for itself. Super excited to have you, Fred. And we have Kala Allison. Kala is the founder and director of the Marine Protected Area Collaborative Network. Much of what Kala learned about local ocean policy implementation came from her years as the Marine Protection Officer for the City of Laguna Beach and as director for the Orange County MPA Council, OCMPAC, I think that's how that's pronounced. After serving as a member of the Marine Life Protection Act Initiative's South Coast Regional Stakeholder Group, Kala became focused on expanding the OCMPAC model of local engagement in MPA management statewide, and the collaborative network was born. Very well network, uh, great to work with Kala. And finally, Samantha Murray, you can find her on Zoom at the Fish and Game Commission meetings where she is president of the five person body that adopted California's marine protected areas and will oversee the 10 year review. She's also the executive director of an interdisciplinary master's program in marine, biodiverse, in marine biodiversity and conservation at Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UCSD, where she also teaches graduate courses. Samantha has two decades of professional experience directing ocean and water programs at a variety of NGOs and has served on the Marine Protected Area Federal Advisory Committee, as well as various Marine Life Protection Act initiative bodies. That is our panel. Really, none of that could be cut out. It's an epic panel, and I think I will just, with that, toss it over to Jules to get us started. Thanks so much, Laura. Good morning, everyone. Can we hear me okay? Yes. Thank you. Uh, so thank you so much for this opportunity to be here today. I'm calling in um, from Kumeyaay land and we're celebrating uh, California's Marine Protected Area Network, which is the first comprehensive science-based network of MPAs in the United States. It was developed over an eight year planning process based on input from scientists and hundreds of stakeholders from throughout the state. It resulted in 124 MPAs covering more than a half million acres of protected marine habitats, including coastal wetlands, rocky reefs, and other various ecosystems between Mexico and Oregon. Despite the success, and while the process to create California's MPAs included thousands of hours of stakeholder input, representing a broad range of perspectives and interests, the process wasn't fully inclusive. For example, when the MPA, when the, pardon me, when the Marine Life Protection Act, the legislation that called for a statewide network of MPAs was passed in 1999, it did not include specific reference to the rights or roles of the California Native American tribes who have stewarded coastal and ocean resources since time immemorial. Unfortunately, today we do not have California tribal representation on this panel. But tribes have done an extraordinary amount of work over the last decade and made many tangible, concrete gains within the state of California. There is, of course, more work to be done on indigenous-led conservation, including in MPA management. Now, 10 years after its establishment in 2012, the state is evaluating the MPA network to better understand its success and areas of improvement. We are seeing more fish in no-take reserves. Students are enjoying more programs to engage in coastal and marine science, stewardship, and recreation. And more stakeholders are working together to advance our MPA goals, as evidenced by an incredible MPA collaborative network that represents a myriad of coastal stakeholders across the state. 
while enforcement remains challenging, the state has taken many important steps to promote compliance with new MPA regulations and with the support of state legislature has strengthened laws to address poaching. As new MPAs are established throughout the world in accordance with global targets, California's post-designation efforts provide a valuable and educational case study for local, national, and international MPA managers. So the process was imperfect and at times messy, and we still face challenges today. But extraordinary work has been done over the last 20 plus years to make California's MPA network successful, and we are seeing many of those benefits today. Let's learn about some of these successes and challenges. We can jump right into the questions. First up, Fred, where did the idea of the Marine Life Protection Act come from? What was the vision and how did the process work? Well, thank you very much. Thank you for including me and thank you for having this important gathering today. And thank you all for the parts that you have played, are playing, and will continue to play with regard to MPAs in California. To get to your question, when I arrived in the legislature in the late 1990s, we took myself, my legislative director, David Bunn at the time, and a number of other folks around the Capitol in, the scientific community and marine sciences and so on, uh, we had a few meetings. And what seemed readily apparent to me is the following, that when California was founded in the 1850s and the Fish and Game Commission was one of the very first parts of California government, and in fact is one of the rare Fish and Game Commissions now called Fish and Wildlife Commission embedded in the state constitution. So we thought that we had a good vehicle for modernizing how we manage the marine environment. A way to think about it is, and the way we were thinking about it is, that in the 1850s up until maybe the 1940s, what we had was abundance in both the marine environment and the terrestrial environment. And the consequence from a management perspective or the challenge from a management perspective was how do you manage abundance? And so for decades and decades and decades, the answer to that question became, you don't have to manage very much at all because it's abundant. Well, as California continued to grow into a very large state with 70% of the folks who live in the state within a one and a half hours drive at the coast, and we started seeing numbers uh, declining in terms of fisheries, it became apparent that we're now managing scarcity, not managing abundance. When you're managing abundance, if you don't have to do much, when you're managing scarcity, you have to do a lot. And that was the thought in a highly conceptualized way, that was the thought that drove the Marine Life Management Act, the Marine Life Protection Act was exactly that. How is it that we can manage scarcity? How do we manage scarcity here? And one of the other things that we observed in the process of putting the legislation together was that there were MPAs of sorts all over the place and the California coast, but it was not what I think we would all agree was a coherent integrated strategy uh, with, as you mentioned, enforcement and scientific observation and being able to measure whether the strategies being used were effective. And then lastly, the uh, notion of dealing with the water column rather than this species here and this species over here and this species over here, working essentially in the water column because of the interdependence of all of that life within the water column. And that gave rise to the Marine Life Protection Act and uh, a, I think uh, uh, more than, than decent effort uh, has gone into really making that operational. So again, thank you all very much for the part you're playing in that. 
Thank you so much, Fred, for providing that wonderful context. Francesca, welcome, good morning. So the process to create MPAs was undertaken many years ago, and we've had our network now for 10 years. What does a successful MPA look like underwater? And are we seeing any examples of that today in California? Good morning, thank you for having me. Uh, thank you, Fred, for kicking us off. And, um, you know, I've been known to be a little bit of a rule breaker. So I'm going to actually show you some photos of what a healthy MPA looks like, both underwater and uh, at the intertidal. Um, so let me get to uh, tell me if I'm sharing my screen, folks. Not yet. Okay. Let's see if I can figure this out. Bear with me, thank you. How about now? It's sharing, but it's black. Sometimes you need to double click. Sorry, go ahead. I need to double click what? Sometimes you need to double click on the item that you want to show. I thought this was just the deep, deep water, Francesca, you're diving to these days. <laughs> Nothing yet? <laughs> Still black. Um, if you want me to share it, Francesca, if you put it in the chat or, or email. Okay, us. that's what I'm going to do. Why don't I do that? Thank Honestly, you. Francesca, I'm just loving your background so much. I'm fine with it. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> Looks like something out of Architectural Digest. <laughs> All right. If I can get out of this, I'm going to put it in the chat. Um, so as I'm fumbling the technology, and let me get this in the chat, um, what I was going to say is that um, the most robust and productive and healthy MPAs are those that have a myriad of species, um, both in terms of fish and invertebrates and marine mammals and seabirds and, um, and humans and humans doing different things. Um, it is a place where people come to gather, to live, to feed, to explore, to discover. And um, one of the things that I feel so fortunate um, to be able to do in the marine protected areas um, is share what I've seen and learned um, over the years by being underwater. Uh, let me see if that has gone through the chat. Looks like it's loading. We're at like 50%. Um, so in terms of um, the species, you know, we are not only fortunate to be um, in what I consider the, the greatest state in the United States, but our coastline, including the variety of regions that we protected in the Marine Life Protection Act initiative, um, there I, it's, it should be in the chat, Laura. Um, um, these marine ecosystems look diverse, not just in terms of the wildlife and the charismatic megafauna, but they look diverse in terms of how people enjoy them. Um, and that could be simply viewing wildlife, that could be scientists and community activists monitoring and sharing what's happening in their backyards, that could be uh, fishing, it could be diving, it could be surfing, it could be um, hiking, it could be tide pooling, it could be celebrating an anniversary, a loved one, all of these things, we all harvest memories, seafood and moments right off of our coasts. And the, the, the thing that is always the constant backdrop um, is this beautiful marine ecosystem, which comes with, you know, giant kelp forests and um, eelgrass, rocky intertidals, and all of the variations in between. Um, 
I think the other thing that even though a lot of these marine protected areas are healthy, what we're seeing are changes. Uh, we're seeing changes in the number of people that are coming to our coasts. We're seeing changes in the climate. And even when we have these systems um, and these buffer zones that are there to ensure the healthy productivity of all kinds of marine species, what we're seeing are changes in actually how they work together and how we work in them. So we're seeing things like sea star wasting disease, we're seeing the kelp forest die off, we're seeing these changes. And because of that, we're also seeing innovation and positivity coming from different people who wanna to contribute to making sure that those climate changes that we're seeing have reduced the number of impacts to our interaction with these special places, with the sort of ecosystem engine services they provide us from clean air to clean water to food. Um, I don't know if we're able to get the slides up, but there's an assortment of those images in, um, in, the, in, in the imagery that I sent for folks to see. These are amazing pictures, Francesca. I love just how it shows the diversity of the entire marine protected area network and the fact that we can still be out there and enjoy them and there's such a diversity of, of uses and ways to enjoy them. I think that often gets missed when people talk about protected areas. They think of them as being far away, you know, somewhere that's um, protected that isn't a part of their their day to day and, and what they get to experience. So this really shows that this is this is really a part of California and something that we can all steward and enjoy um, and see the benefits of. These are great. Yeah, and I'd just like to mention of all those photos, all those images are uh, within marine protected areas along the North Central Coast. So some of them are in um, Carmel, some of them are, are in Monterey, some of them are in Half Moon Bay, some of them are off San Francisco, some of them are Sonoma, some of them are Mendocino. Um, every image you see there is in an actual marine protected reserve or marine conservation area or marine park. Um, and so I hope that shows the breadth of how, um, how healthy they actually are and how important they are to various activities. Thank you so much, Francesca. Um, the photos are absolutely incredible. I can't wait to get off the panel and go look you up and connect with you on Instagram. Uh, this question is for everyone on the panel, wondering what are some of your most pronounced or unexpected benefits of MPAs that we've seen in the last decade? Well, I'll offer up something from a non-scientific point of view. Uh, and that is this, that uh, I, happen to also have the good fortune of being on the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary Foundation uh, Board of Directors. And the MPAs are a major focus of the education and information that is uh, shared with the public on a, on a uh, very thorough basis. An example of that would be the the Sanctuary Exploration Center in Santa Cruz, which was built by the uh, by NOAA and NOAA Sanctuaries uh, in Santa Cruz as an introduction to the Monterey Bay and the National Marine Sanctuary. In that environment, lots of school children are moved into and through the Sanctuary Exploration Center, which also has a wet lab in it and various kinds of, <clears throat> excuse me, various kinds of interactive uh, displays and so on. And the reason I raised that is that I think that that, together with the work being done at 
on, on the public side, if you will, the availability of the public to access the work of the various very high uh, quality marine research institutes around the Monterey Bay. So Long Marine Lab, Moss Landing Marine Lab, Hopkins Marine Station, Ambari, uh, and so on. You move around the bay. And what we see is that they all have a good educational component where there's a continuity of providing education and information uh, about MPAs. The thing that I like especially about that is that I think we, we know this, uh, and that is that we have a large population, California is changing demographically, and it is important for students in the San Joaquin Valley or the Pajaro Valley or elsewhere, where they've, in many cases, not ever been to the coast, for them to get to the coast, provide access to the coast, provide educational opportunities. And the marine protected areas are such a fine example. It's understandable. What problem were you trying to solve? What solution is in place? How is that working? Because it's measurable. By doing that with, with and advising and educating students, especially students of color, what we're doing is helping them fall in love, fall in love with the ocean. What we love, we'll protect. And I think that's one of the very uh, positive direct impacts of the marine protected area chain up and down California, but certainly speaking to the Central Coast and to the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, it's a particularly good tool for education. Fred, that deeply resonates as a youth coach. What you love, you protect, and we're helping the students fall in love. I couldn't have said it better myself. Thank you so much. Any other panelists that would like to contribute? Hi, Jules. Yeah, I'd love to, to just mention a few things from a from a different angle, more maybe, I suppose, from the, the science and management side of things. You know, it's, I wouldn't say these are unexpected benefits, uh, but for how young our MPA network is, it's been pretty extraordinary to see that we do have bigger, more fish of greater diversity within um, some of our MPA boundaries already. You know, in the Central Coast, we've got cabazon, lingcod, black rockfish that are more abundant inside MPAs, black abalone that are bigger inside MPAs. Um, and, you know, these results are especially pronounced in our older MPAs, right, at the Northern Channel Islands or at Point Lobos, Point Cabrillo. We, you know, Point Cabrillo, we've got double the biomass and abundance of targeted fish species in kelp and shallow rock ecosystems uh, compared to outside. So those are, you know, those are some really satisfying early benefits that we're seeing on the science side. And then some things I don't, I don't know if we were expecting, like, um, there, there have been studies, there's at least one study that's been published talking about how inside MPA boundaries of the Channel Islands, we see that invasive sargassum has been kept at bay. And there was this sort of, um, yeah, this effect of being able to, to, to keep that invasive algae um, from, from really taking over inside the MPA. We've got evidence of spillover, um, you know, benefits fish leaving MPAs and, and, and going and taking all those, um, all, all that productivity outside of MPA boundaries. And spillover is not easy to document. Um, often you have to use sort of DNA barcoding to, to be able to do it, but we've got a couple studies from the San Diego Scripps State Marine Conservation Area and Reserve, and then Carmel Bay and Monterey Bay. So being able to see that documented spillover is also really important. Um, Contextualizing, Francesca talked about this a little bit, but contextualizing these oceanographic changes we're seeing um, with you know, the warm, wet, warm water blob events we've got, the sea star wasting disease, we've got a lot happening uh, in the ocean right now. And to be able to have these research areas where we can eliminate some of the confounding impacts um, and really just isolate and look at the science of what's happening you know, inside the MPAs which was particularly useful when you think about the, the Plains All-American oil spill that happened um, several years ago, 2015, 2016, you know, some years ago now, but to be able to have this research record um, of the local MPAs there and, and say like, 
better quantify, you know, the habitats and the wildlife inside because we had this longstanding research record. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is, you know, fishing. You know, profitability of fishing is dependent on many factors, fuel prices, markets, weather, oceanographic conditions, but generally, you know, these sort of gloom and doom concerns that we heard at the outset of the MLPA, you know, worrying that everybody was going to go out of business, we wouldn't have healthy fishing communities. Generally, you know, according to, to the statistics, average individual revenue and commercial landings are, are steady or increasing in some cases. Then, you know, I, I would hesitate to connect that directly to the MPAs, but it's nice to see that fishing is still happening and is still profitable in California. Thank you, Samantha, for speaking both to the scientific aspects of where we are today, as well as unanticipated, uh, unexpected, wonderful things that have happened as well. Any other panelists would like to chime in? Sure, I'll just chime in anecdotally. Um, I was just actually out at Catalina doing some work on the boundaries and, and took my son with me. And he had just done a report on marine protected areas for school and, you know, did some research and interviewed me and interviewed a couple others. Um, but it wasn't until we were actually out there swimming and in a marine protected area that he saw so many fish. And he's like, mom, I wish I would have done this before my report because I saw it with my own eyes, like how the difference of swimming and playing around outside of the protected area and then being in the protected area and just seeing the bigger fish, the more fish, being able to get closer to them. Um, you know, the, the marine protected areas, especially in Avalon and, and Catalina are pretty tame. Um, and just having that penny drop to see the difference that marine protected areas could make um, in size and abundance and biodiversity and all that just clicked. And it was just showed me, you know, also the benefits and how tangible they can be. And also the importance of education, you know, for our youth and having people see it and experience it uh, firsthand was a great experience for, for me and my son, hopefully. It's truly amazing uh, how we are able to see the world differently through the lens of children. Thank you so much for sharing that heartwarming story, uh, Kala. Kala and anyone else who wants to answer, could you talk about some of the different stakeholders who took part in this process and how regional perspectives were represented? I might can get us started. and I'm, I'm sure Samantha can chime in uh, as we're both part of the stakeholder group. Um, you know, we had the, the four different regions that brought together stakeholders that were really meant to represent um, diverse sectors. So commercial and recreational fishers, uh, nonprofit conservation organizations. We had some city, state and federal government. Um, you know, we've, we've learned a lot of how we could have done better and diversifying that representation and, and different stakeholders, of course. Um, but at the time, it was it was kind of this new idea to have this stakeholder driven process and have this um, huge difference of opinions get together and try to figure out, you know, based on the science, where these marine protected areas um, should go. And it's it's an interesting concept. I think we've we've learned a lot. Um, about who should be involved and who should be involved um, throughout the process and then moving forward into the management, of course. Um, but the, the idea was, you know, breaking it up into regions was acknowledging that there was going to be different priorities in different parts of the state. I mean, you really just can't compare Southern California to, to the North Coast um, to the Bay Area. They're just very, very different areas. Mm -hmm. um, and they're going to have, you know, different perspectives um, and different insights and being able to leverage all that expertise. I know being a stakeholder myself, I learned so much in the process from the other uh, members of that stakeholder group. And I just think that the experience is invaluable. Um, I think it should be part of putting together any type of network of marine protected areas or any marine singular marine protected area. Um, but I think we, we can do better in the future. And I think we all learned a lot. I don't know if you want to add some more, Samantha, to that one. 
I'd be curious if Francesca has anything else to add. We we served on the North Central Coast Regional Stakeholder Group together. So, Francesca. Sure. So, um, it was an epic endeavor of what I now call sausage making. <laughs> and what I really enjoyed the most was hearing all of those different perspectives. And as someone who has a variety of ways that I use the marine resources and enjoy them and want to share them, you know, whether it is simply, you know, being on the water, sailing, hiking, fishing, diving, what you find out is that there are really different cultural differences in the way that people harvest food, the way that people have ceremony and remembrance, and the way that people interact. And I think while there's definitely a, always a better way to look back and say, oh, we should have done this and we could have done this and so on and so forth. Um, I love that it was this beginning of a public, private, stakeholder, everybody from all walks of life kind of endeavor. And I, when I think back to the Marine Life Protection Act and my time as a stakeholder, a primary stakeholder representing divers, both scuba divers and free divers at the time, I think about all of the connections that I made that I have that are still ongoing, that are robust and that are growing. Um, I think about my dear friend, Marcy, who runs a nonprofit organization called Azul.org, which is the first uh, ocean conservation organization that specifically addresses, engages, and promotes the way that our friends in the Spanish-speaking communities around the world engage with the ocean. And some of that, I think, was born out of the fact that during her time in the MLPA I process, she felt like she was the only one. And now here we are, fast forward to she and her organization are on the steering committee of this California Oceans Day, which is great because we're representing the people that utilize these resources and that live, work, breathe, dream, and have all their experiences in the state of California. So for me, those kinds of examples are the really positive ones coming out of the lessons learned where maybe it wasn't perfect when we started, but we're improving and we're growing. Find my dad a comment on that if that's all right. Uh, the comment I'd like to add is this, and, and I think that that was a, a very thoughtful characterization of what happened uh, and, and what has happened. I'll, I'd like to add a couple of points on this because I think that the MPA process itself, both in the legislature and once the concept became law is worth a moment of comment and observation. Uh, Francesca mentioned uh, sausage making. Uh, fair enough. Uh, those of us who live in the sausage making business called legislation, uh, that is what we know. That is the process we're in all the time. Uh, whether it's in the environment space or the housing space or the justice space, whatever it may be, legislating that process you described as sausage making is, uh, is a process that in this case uh, actually worked, which was when we started this, it was a two year process before we got the bill signed by the governor. And it was the last bill that the governor signed while he, had, uh, while he was in office because there was reluctance about this all the way through the process legislatively. But what we stayed with was finding a principled compromise without asking anyone to compromise their principles. And that by using that as the dynamic, we were able to find this common ground that became the Marine Life Protection Act. Now, once that moved from making law to implementing law, it was also new and different. And as you all know, there were two false starts at this in the process. And so the idea of how to take law and science, which are not 
even close to the same thing and put them together in a way that will have measurable positive results was not easy either in the legislature or during the first two efforts to establish the MPAs. But what people did do, both inside state government, in nonprofits, in the research community, in commercial fishers, sport fishers, tribes, everyone else said, we believe in this enough that we're gonna stay with it. You know, first time it, it tried to stand it up and it fell down, people could have walked away. Second time stand it up, kind of crumbles a little bit, people could have walked away. They didn't do that. Instead, what they did is soldiered on every day to try to make this happen. And I think that's a testament to the core value and belief system of the people involved in this process. They did feel, once you got into that third inning, if you will, that it was a process that had integrity to it. There wasn't some hidden agenda to drive every fisher out of business. They saw that their values and beliefs and principles could be integrated into this in such a way that marine protected areas now were a real thing rather than painting lines on the ocean. And I think that that's when, when both those worlds can come together, the world of lawmaking, the world of marine science, and the stakeholders involved therein. This is a, a wonderful model, not only because of the success in the ocean, because it indicates a pathway and a, a way that many environmental issues that threaten us in the global climate change space have a chance of working. Thank you, Fred. I think that that's a wonderful transition uh, to a follow-up question as it relates to legislation. So Fred, Sam, others, how do our state MPAs fit into the context of global, federal, and state 30 by 30 efforts? Well, I think I'll just pick up where I left off. My, my sense is that a couple of things have happened that are very positive in that regard. Uh, one is that uh, and this is, sounds very inside baseball, and I can understand why, uh, but, but you all are inside baseball players, so it's all good. This won't sound so strange to you. But I think one of the most important uh, uh, moments in this was when the California Ocean Science Trust became the ocean science advisor to the Ocean Protection Council. The reason I think that was important, that happened when uh, now state senator, but then secretary of resources, John Laird, worked that through. Uh, and the reason, the importance of that as I see it is that for an environmental solution or package of bills or single bill that are addressing an environmental issue, uh, once the bill is signed into law, that's, not the end, that's the beginning of something. And it is not possible for very many laws to have very much salutary and beneficial effect unless there is an everyday commitment to it. So if the MPA concept sat over in fish and wildlife by itself, competing with everything else all the time, administratively, budgetarily, et cetera, that would be one way. But I think what, what the state has done, a uh, couple of governors in a row, a couple of secretaries of the Natural Resources Agency in a row, et cetera, have said, we're going to elevate this concept to the OPC level, which is a regular center point or intersection of science and policy that helps the administration adjust budgetary issues, regulatory issues, et cetera. So I think that's a, that's a very positive view because anybody who knows me knows I'm irrationally optimistic, but it is a positive turn of events, the stacking of the boxes to move Cal OST into the OPC so that the, the uh, 
marine protected areas are constantly getting attention at the highest levels of state government. I might add something else in addition to that, Jules, if it's okay. Um, as was mentioned earlier, I serve on the Greater Fairlands National Marine Sanctuary Advisory Council, which is obviously um, an advisory council for a federal designation marine sanctuaries. And what's unique, I think, in California is that one, we have marine protected areas in our national marine sanctuaries, and two, um, that whole public private work together agency resource managers residents stakeholders tribes everyone that comes together in that inter interface not just in terms of the marine protected areas but all of these ecosystems that we are trying to restore and protect and a very explicit exact example is that earlier Fred um, uh, Secretary Panetta was talking about continuing resolutions. Well, I have good news for everyone that this recent omnibus budget that was just passed, we've been advocating for three years for money to help monitor, manage, understand, and restore working with the OPC and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife through sanctuaries, keeping ecosystem, ecosystems living and productive. The very first start of an earmark, $2 million to go towards the tribes, the nonprofits, the resource managers that are looking at what is happening here, how do we need to supplement and adjust to make sure that we can keep these systems healthy. And that is all interlaced between federal and state. And you might say that the Marine Life Protection Act is where we all learned how to work together and, and contribute together and get the most benefit out of our efforts together. Speaking of contributing and being a stakeholder, Samantha, and, and thank you for that, Francesca. Uh, Samantha, as a stakeholder in the MPA design process and the now president of the Fish and Game Commission, can you describe some of the challenges, including those related to tribes, that we face in developing California's current network of MPAs, as well as where we are now in terms of MPA management and tribal engagement? Yeah, thanks so much for the question, Jules. The, the tribal issue has come up a few times just in this panel already, and it's, it's a really important topic, so I'm grateful you asked. I do wanna start by acknowledging my own positionality as a white woman who sits in a position of relative power on the Fish and Game Commission. So I, I really cannot and will not speak for California tribes, but I can talk about what I have seen from where I sit. Um, you know, there are more than 100 federally recognized California tribes and tribal communities in California, as well as dozens more who have not received federal recognition. And many tribes harvest marine resources within their ancestral territories and maintain really intimate relationships with the coast for ongoing customary uses. But the Marine Life Protection Act, as we, we mentioned earlier, it was, it was silent on tribes, right? And that's not unusual. That's not just the Marine Life Protection Act. That's of, frankly, probably most environmental laws, certainly of that of that time, but it was a significant policy and social justice oversight that California tribes and tribal communities named, particularly on the North Coast, named very emphatically and, and passionately. So I, I witnessed those protests on the North Coast and they were um, they were appropriate, they were important, they were necessary. And you know, on the North Coast, after some of that um, controversy, the state did make a decision to support continued traditional non-commercial tribal use in, in specific specified North Coast MPAs. And that was the first time that California had ever, to my knowledge, provided a broad formal recognition of the unique status of tribes with respect to natural resources. So that was a really important first step. And you know, my view is that today, that complicated and messy history has had a, just an incredibly important effect on state governance. Um, tribal leaders worked extraordinarily hard and had a long overdue conversation with the state. And as a result, those, those tribal leaders secured important concrete outcomes. And I'd like to share some of those outcomes, if that's okay. Yeah. So, so in 2011, Governor Brown codified his commitment to tribes 
in an executive order that called for government to government consultation between the state and tribes, created a tribal advisor position within the office of the governor. Tribal representatives now have four dedicated seats on the interagency MPA state, statewide leadership team. Um, on the MPA front specifically, in 2018, the Fish and Game Commission amended boundaries at Stewart's Point State Marine Reserve in Sonoma County, um, and then also authorized ceremonial, cultural, and subsistence uses in, in Santa Barbara, Ventura, and LA County MPAs in response to requests submitted by the Santa Ynez Band of the Chumash Indians. Um, we now see, this is not directly relevant to the state MPAs, but seeing the, the Chumash National Marine Sanctuary proposal um, in the federal um, reserve, you know, see, seeing that as a federal National Marine Sanctuary proposal is so inspiring and impactful and, you know, would be the first National Marine Sanctuary that is, um, uh, that is, that is driven by tribes, for tribes, um, ideally would be co-managed in some way by tribes as well and for, you know, cultural tribal significance. And, and that's really powerful as well. We did see in MPA monitoring, the Talawa Dene led a baseline uh, monitoring project in the North Coast. That was the first state funded marine research project in California that actually incorporated indigenous traditional knowledge, the Ocean Protection Council, with, which Fred just mentioned, I think just recently dispersed a million dollars to support development of a tribal marine stewards network um, to focus on MPA monitoring. And I'll just close by saying on the commission side, um, we created a tribal subcommittee on the commission. Uh, a, the governor's office appointed the CEO of a prominent tribe, uh, the Trinidad Rancheria to our commission. We work really closely um, with California Native American tribes to better understand concerns. And you know, just in the last year, we acted on a petition received from the Karuk tribe to list the Upper Klamath Trinity River Spring Chinook Salmon under the California Endangered Species Act. Just, I think it was last month, we made a difficult decision to suspend commercial harvest of bull kelp in response to a petition that came to us from the Intertribal Sinkyong Wilderness Council. So, you know, that's a really long winded answer. But again, this has come up a few times. And I think it's it's so important to name and talk about, you know, even if, you know, we, we unfortunately don't have a California tribal representative on this panel. But what, what I've seen is that California's effort to involve tribes and tribal communities who have fished, harvested, gathered along the state's coastline for millennia. Um, to, to really ensure a leadership role for these tribes in resource management decisions. It is absolutely ongoing. It is not finished. It's a journey that has not been fully resolved and the state has a lot more work to do, but it's clear that tribal leaders have worked extraordinarily hard and secured important concrete outcomes, really appropriately and importantly elevating the role of, of tribes and tribal communities in a variety of ocean and coastal policy uh, avenues and venues, so. Thank you so much, Samantha, for that insight acknowledgement and those specific action items. I'm so excited to see what the Shumash National Sanctuary um, becomes and I encourage everyone to follow along and support them in social media or uh, directly. We are now at our time of 10.50 a.m. We can go a little bit longer. If anyone would like to speak to uh, stakeholder engagement management, share any personal connections with MPAs or anything that you would like to share as we wrap up our segment today. Yeah, I'd like to just talk a little bit about some of the great successes. I mean, we talked about the successes of marine protected areas and just in the habitat and the ecosystem, but I think it's also important to, to recognize um, just the success. Well, I think one of the biggest successes is kind of how the state has recognized the importance of the ongoing engagement of stakeholders, communities, and tribes. Um, in MPA management and stewardship. I, mean, I think this is huge. It really just shows um, the partnership that we have with the state and our community members and tribal members. Um, and it's, you know, we hear this a lot that it's resource management. We're not managing the resources themselves. We're managing people 
around them. And it can't be one group of people managing another group of people. It has to be a we, it has to be an us. And we're really redefining what that means, um, what the we means, how we all need to take on that responsibility of, of being ocean stewards. And that's really being recognized. And I think oh, it's, it's exciting, it's a big success. And we just appreciate the state, um, the partnership with the state and recognizing the, the power of the community. Um, and making these MPAs really, really matter. So well said, Kella. Are there any other uh, contributions anyone would like to speak to? I just have a quick anecdote. I, um, you know, I'm uh, usually hanging out on the North Coast, but this past weekend I was down in Kala's neck of the woods and I was at the um, tide pools in Laguna uh, at the beach at Aliso Creek. And, you know, it was a beautiful day, families everywhere, everyone's out, people frolicking in the waves, a lot of people going over to the tide pools to see what was in there and who lived there and what was going on. And there was one person who was with her family who she looked like she might've wanted to harvest some of the mussels that were exposed on the rocky substrate. And I was like, oh no, what do I do? Do I do something? Do I say something? And I was like, you know what? I'm, you know, everyone else being respectful, watching, not touching, enjoying. And I, I decided not to say something. And as soon as I decided not to say something, there were a pod of dolphins that came up right in front of the reef. And this woman's relative, a young child could have been her grandson was pulling her and calling her to go and look at these dolphins and to be in awe of the beauty and the wildlife. And it just felt sort of cosmic. It just felt like if we can share the positive nature of these places and make sure everyone has access to them, then it doesn't need to be a don't do this. It can become a here is something that you get to enjoy, that you get to share with your family. And when, as Fred said earlier, when people care about it, then they will take care of it. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you so much, Francesca. I know it deeply resonates with me. We have a wonderful program at Wild Coast called Tide Pool Ambassadors, and the struggle of when to interact and how is real. So thank you for sharing how the Earth's divine timing kind of assisted in that process. We are now at 1054. Any last comments as we wrap up this wonderful panel? I have a comment if you can, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I was involved in the development of an oceanographic teaching station at Manhattan Beach uh, years ago in the 70s. And uh, there's some discussion going on that uh, there are a number of teaching stations along the coast that are, are not focused in the way uh, that, that you are in a way, but, and they're very isolated. Uh, but there's been some discussion about trying to stitch them together uh, in some kind of loose collaboration, but with the idea, uh, somebody was talking about uh, uh, students uh, coming down and uh, experiencing the ocean. And those are, I think, um, potentially very uh, effective gathering places for, uh, for students and others uh, and creating then a, a basis for interest in the oceans more broadly. Um, but anyway, it's something to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Absolutely. At this time, it is now 1055. I will defer to Laura Walsh and leave us with a message of gratitude in our ancestral language. We say <laughs> Thank you to everyone for this wonderful opportunity to be in community with us celebrating the MLPA and sharing with us all of your wonderful work. Laura. Thank you, Jules. Thank you, everyone. That was amazing. Oh, there's two of us. Laura's helping out with the Ocean Day Steering Committee, so I'll let Laura Zihan take it. But I just want to thank the MPA panel. That was fantastic. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. That was incredible. Um, thank you for all of your work and the storytelling um, about these incredible places. 
um, and it's just amazing that we're at 10 years of um, having the this um, you know marine protected area network um, that is just a shining example for the rest of the country and other parts of the world as well. Um, so just in a couple of minutes, we're going to get started with the next panel, which is all about storytelling for, about the sea. Um, so folks can hang tight and we will be getting started momentarily. And I'll just share my screen so you can see what is to come. Too many tabs up. Here we go. And then I know we didn't have time for Q&A for that panel, but um, if folks do have questions and you want to reach any of the panelists, um, you can put them in the chat. We'll make sure we share them um, if folks have had to leave. And we can also email them to the different panelists to, to get those questions answered. Um, so feel free to, to drop any questions or comments in the chat. Thank you, Laura. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to switch to, to my screen here as folks get settled. Yeah, that's great. Great. Welcome, Lisa. I'm Hi, Laura. Spotlight you. <laughs> great. Well, as everybody's transitioning from panels, we can use these couple moments to maybe do some introductions. We really want to hear from as many people as possible on the line here. And so I'm going to go ahead and drop in some questions in the chat for you all. Um, but uh, let me just real quick um, bring those up. And I just would love to know who's on the line. So your name, your organization, your role with that organization, if relevant. And then also a fun question, um, one word or phrase that describes your first memory of the ocean. So I'll go ahead and enter those into the chat here and then repull the screen up. Can everybody see that? Great. Thank you. It was lovely to hear a little bit from that earlier panel and some of the stories that they shared as well um, about the successes over the years, as well as their personal experiences. Um, 